All right, hi, and welcome to the New Trust Economy. This is Monica Profit, and I'm here with Brian Smokovich of Block Apps. Hi, Brian. Hi, Monica. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for making the time. I really look forward to talking with you more about the projects that you've been working on. It sounds like you've been deep in tech for a long time, and in blockchain, I would I kind of wonder why you haven't written a book yet, honestly. It sounds to me like you've got <laughs> some pretty deep knowledge of this space, and uh, I'm hoping that we can like take... <laughs> all of your deep knowledge and make it easy enough for, for everybody that's listening to understand it. So uh, thank you so much for bringing your expertise onto this show. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to help. Maybe a, maybe a book's one day in the stars. I've, I've written a, a couple articles that people can find online, but uh, yeah, just we'll be a, sure that a high level of commitment. <laughs> yeah, it is a high level of commitment. I, I can definitely attest to that. And, uh, and we'll definitely um, include those links uh, below that are in our podcast so that you can people can go and find the things that you've written so far and also hopefully subscribe if you're on Medium so they can be uh, made aware of what you're putting out. Do you put out a lot of content? Not anymore. I used to write uh, more frequently before I was more so in the space, uh, trying to more trying to establish myself. Yep. But ever since I've uh, been working for Block Apps, it's just you know band bandwidth issues don't really allow me to to write as much content as I'd like to. Well, I hope that this can also kind of bring a little bit of light to the content that comes out of you from your time at Block Apps, because it sounds like Block Apps is doing some really exciting things. Um, you were, I mean, we kind of talked about it a little bit, some of the really cool partners and, and new things that are going on, not all of which you can talk about, because it's, of course, Block mm -hmm. Apps business, but um, of the things that you can talk about, can you just maybe kind of touch on a couple of the main sectors that you've been most excited to work in? Yeah, so the, the sectors that I personally work in mainly are finance, travel, energy, um, and we've done some work in ticketing, uh, supply chain, uh, healthcare, as well as agriculture. So we have clients across all, pretty much every vertical at this point. Um, it's just that certain clients, obviously, we, as you mentioned, we can't name uh, certain things are under NDA, and hopefully those production applications will be released at some point during this year. That is fantastic. That's actually a great problem to have. Like, I have so much business and I can't tell you about it. If I told you, I'd have to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, I think you did mention ticketing, though. That's one that you can talk about, right? I can talk about ticketing. Um, so we built, or we, we, uh, we, we, we didn't build it, but it is on our platform, and it's an application called uh, Upgraded. So Upgraded basically solves the double spend uh, the, the double spend problem when it comes to ticket sales. So if you have uh, a digital ticket online and uh, Ticketmaster or whatever retailer sells this ticket, um, some say I buy this ticket and then I want to resell it to StubHub, right? So that QR code that goes along with it isn't uh, it, it isn't made so that other people can't use it anymore, right? It, it, it's ah, reusable. Right. So some people show up to shows, they show up to concerts, uh, sporting events, whatever it may be, and they can't get in because this, this ticket's been used by someone who resold it, even though they kept it for themselves. Right. So what Upgraded does is it puts the tickets on the blockchain to give a single source of truth for the custody of who owns the ticket. And then once the ticket changes hands, then that previous owner can no longer use it to get into this event. Uh, and Upgraded recently was acquired by a Ticketmaster uh, at some point uh, mid last year. So well, that's just a uh, no brainer. They're going to be a main to watch out for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah. you can't get any simpler than that. Just like, come on, we just need to stop the fraud in this one basic way. I mean, I, I can see that as being, I've been looking for the Gateway app or the Gateway, um, well, really, not whether it's an app or an application in any sense. Which, what's going to be that one gateway vertical or that gateway interaction that's going to get people to go, oh, blockchain's got value. Now I'm, I'm going to ask, I'm going to care, care about it. Is it on the blockchain? Because the blockchain has, has made my consumer experience markedly better. You know? So when is that going to happen where it's not like a, a nerd's domain to talk about blockchain, <laughs> which I hate to, to tell you, you're, you know, you're in the nerd game. If, if, you're, if you're on this podcast, you're probably in the nerd game with me. <laughs> But you yeah, know, I'm some, well, I'm certainly here. So <laughs> yeah, you're definitely in it, knee deep at least. Um, so you were talking about something with ticketing um, in the airline industry as well, right? Yeah. So that's one of the projects that uh, the bigger projects that I actually can name. So we're partnering with uh, United Airlines, obviously a very well-known airline, along with uh, ARC, which is the uh, airlines reporting corporation, as well as uh, one of our implementation partners called BlockSky. So all of us together are building a blockchain application uh, for United to help uh, automate and expedite the reporting and reconciliation of, uh, of uh, airline ticket sales between. 
uh, between whether d different vendors or even in this in this instance, it would be a smaller use case. So between Arc and United, basically what happens is companies like Arc are focused on the reconciliation of tickets when they come through multiple places, right? So if you want to buy an airline ticket, you can buy it through the United website. You can buy it from a travel agent. You can buy it from Kayak or wherever it may be. And to reconcile all of these tickets in real time in order to get a uh, a true transparency of the, the supply and demand and availability of these uh, these airline seats is, is very difficult. And then the companies that are specifically designed to reconcile generally take a large fee in order to do it. So what this will do is uh, significantly decrease uh, operational expenses. That which is would then so cool. Hopefully be passed on to the end user. <laughs> Uh, hopefully. <laughs> it might take more market forces than just that to, uh, to get some more greater discounts to the end user, but, or maybe not discounts, but just uh, some actually more accurate um, and not inflated pricing, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. With the airline I'm, I'm working on myself to try to get a little extra status, but uh, right? <laughs> it's taking, taking a little longer. If you can't get cheap seats, at least you can get status and have better seats for what you pay for, right? Exactly. You know, it's funny, I, I had some friends um, who lived in Europe um, at the same, around the same time that we had airline prices go up after 9-11. For them, mm -hmm. airline prices went down significantly. And the, out in Europe, the idea was, you know, people are afraid to, to travel and we just want to keep them in the, in the planes. We want to keep them doing this and not forgetting or working around or deciding that like airlines are too frightening after this terrorist attack. And uh, I found it really interesting that the, the choices um, and the, and the, the, I don't know, the response to demographic fear after 9-11 in the States was completely different in terms of pricing. Prices went up quite a bit for a while. And then there was a bit of a depression, but it was never a fire sale that I heard about in Europe. It was really amazing. So I keep wondering what's going to take to, uh, to incentivize cheap everything. I would love to see cheap everything. I'm a bit of a miser that way. Yes, of course. <laughs> do, do you know if they did like an analysis of which, uh, which method ended up being more profitable? I don't. I have no idea. All I know is that you know, it seems like they're all still in the sky and still going, but I, I don't really know <laughs> the, the approach. And I still they're all in business though. still. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, in terms of distance, you know, an, an international flight in Europe can still feel like a regional one in the States. And so maybe those prices are somewhat mm -hmm. comparable. They just seem much more depressed because they're between countries. But I think um, in general, I've noticed that prices are pretty, pretty cheap regionally or, you know, within a certain geographic area in other places, just not in this, not quite so much in the States. It's weird. Like in Asia, as well as in Europe, has been my experience. But I, I totally look forward to being able to like cut out some of the fat in there and see if we can like bring the airline industry into alignment with the, with their international, you know, applications in other places. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think it depends. Like if you want to go to Chicago right now, I'm sure you can get like a hundred dollar ticket, but you're going to be freezing. Right. Right. You have to definitely be ready to have a, a bit of discomfort one way or another, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been working um, in blockchain for a while now. Can you, how long has it been? Has it been a few years now, correct? Uh, no, so I've only, I've been in officially in the blockchain space with block apps since November, 2017. So a little over uh, a year. So about a year and three or four months. Um, before that though, I was, doing some pretty deep research into blockchain. So before I worked for Block Apps, I worked for a boutique management consulting firm, uh, consulting CIOs on their IT infrastructures, uh, mainly around uh, server virtualization and resource management. So with my firm there, I wanted to, I was deep into blockchain. I learned about blockchain from, or I learned about Ethereum originally from a friend of mine who uh, works over at Consensus right now, actually. Um, okay, so you first learned about it uh, from a friend of yours, but like, do you have a, a memory of like the specific moment you realized, oh, this is a big enough deal that I want to go this way? Like, do you remember when you first maybe didn't drink the Kool Aid, but encountered the Kool Aid and realized I, I want to drink that? I think I'm I'm gonna go drink that. I I, I do remember the moment. So after uh, after my buddy had told me, I think I had you know toyed around with ether, uh, ether for a little bit just to just to you know get yeah. dip my toes. Um, and then I wanted to learn more about what it actually was and where I was, it, because I was investing in this, what was I investing in? So I read a really book, good book called, uh, I think it's just Ethereum by Henning Diedrich from, uh, from IBM. Mm -hmm. So the book goes really into detail as far as the, the intricacies and the complexities and of, of, of Ethereum in general, how it works at a basic blockchain protocol level. And as I'm reading this, and I've, I've read some, I continued to read and just digest other blockchain books, things just kind of clicked in my head. I remember being 
reading a, reading one of the books in my bed and just thinking like getting goosebumps as far <laughs> as this is the infrastructure of the future. Yeah. I genuinely think that whether it's blockchain or whether blockchain inspires a new technology, this is going to be the the technological advance that shifts us into a new paradigm that's past the digital age. I couldn't agree more. I absolutely couldn't agree more. It's almost, yeah, you're right. You said past the digital age and it'll be another, a different named age of something else, a distributed <laughs> age, right? A distributed age. Yeah, that's, that's not bad. Yeah. I mean, and the reason I think it's going to have such a big impact is just because um, there's no easy way to instantaneously transfer uh, uh, currencies right now, right? Mm -hmm. there, they ha there are methods, like most, most money is all digital at this point. Like when I when I deposit a check in the bank, um, they're not taking the check and putting it in a, a nice neat little vault that says, you know, Brian Smokovich's money is here. Right. I deposit I deposit the check and they they credit my account digitally with with a with just a, a digital value of numbers. Yep. Um, so we're already at the point where money is digital. It's just not at the point where we can execute uh, automation and financial decisions based or using money for using yeah. whatever currency there is. And maybe like we just said, you know, it's gonna be past the digital age. We now have digital money. We don't have uh, distributed ledger money, right? We, it's, not, it's not a part of the di distributed age yet. And once it is, mm -hmm. those transactions and those engagements with currencies are gonna be a lot, um, a lot easier in a way. It's just that I, I, I can't help but think it, it really comes back to the right interfaces and the right design, which is a big part of, you know, that's where Block Apps comes in to solve mm -hmm. those problems and bring this to as many verticals as possible, which is super exciting. Um, you talked a little bit, I know that we, we caught up a little before this, and you mentioned a really interesting analogy of how many ways that blockchain could end up touching just the average person just by driving their car. Like, so you mentioned a Tesla mm -hmm. car because it would include something other than a gas station, but can you go through that again? I love that analogy. <laughs> yeah, so I guess uh, from, from the very beginning, it's just that they, our age is becoming smarter, right? Everyone's trying to make anything or any digital object uh, smart. You have smart TVs, you have smart watches, you have smart side tables, you have smart thermostats, um, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, thermostats, whatever it may be. Everyone's trying to to connect everything. So what blockchain is going to do is you're going to be able to intertwine essentially um, auto, autom automated uh, money transfer along with the Internet of Things. So the example I was I was mentioning earlier was uh, most Teslas now are are pretty smart. So imagine your Tesla has a digital wallet on it. You pull into a charging station. And then once you pull into a charging station, it automatically reads that your car is there and it can draw, draw the funds based on whatever business logic that you set. Maybe you want to only spend a maximum of $40 or $50 or whatever it may be. And that will pull from your wallet uh, through, through a smart contract and pay for your electricity. Now, say as you're pulling out, um, someone God, hits you, right? Part. This is where it gets they so don't, <laughs> They don't necessarily have uh, autonomous vehicles, right? Or th this select person isn't using their autonomous vehicle and, you know, causes a car crash. So what happens is the car does a self-diagnosis uh, self of you. what's going on. Pull yeah, they crash like, into you. Gonna... Okay. Or, or even you crash into them, whatever it may be, right? However this scenario goes, the you crashing into them may even work better uh, as far as the, the example. But basically it does a, a self-diagnosis and it can take that information and send it to, let's say, your insurance company, which it has on file uh, digitally and immediately, which can then take it, review it. Maybe robots are reviewing the, the claims process. And then within an expedited amount of time, they pay you out digitally um, maybe it could be days, minutes, hours, however it may be, in, back into your wallet. So you're made a whole quickly. Obviously, there's a lot of kinks in that example, uh, operational uh, inefficiencies that maybe technology hasn't been able to breeze by yet as far as you know, fraud and whatever it may be. But at a high level, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the automated and instantaneous transfer of funds between the consumer and the enterprise. And also you talk a bit about automating, right? Because when we think about mm -hmm. automation currently, we're looking at it taking away um, low level jobs or more rote jobs, um, jobs mm -hmm. where you know, people have been uh, taught how to show up, check in, do the thing, don't ask questions and leave. And I feel mm -hmm. like those are the most soul crushing jobs. Um, across the board for most people. Some people just revel in being like, it's a it's habit. It's just a habit. Let's do it. I go mm -hmm. home. My life is somewhere else. You know, that's fine. Yeah, it's a simple, I, it's simple job. They clock in, they get their paycheck. 
Exactly. It, and if those jobs go away, of course, we're going to see huge like shifts in terms of what we consider meaningful and how we even educate our people, how, how we educate children to be adaptable to that. But um, you're talking about automation in a way that's not just discussing uh, taking away rote jobs, but just rote transactions or rote analyses, right? So is maybe, yes, in this analogy that you just said, there's the insurance adjuster loses their job because it's done by sensors inside the car and it's done by automation in that sense. But um, I think it's so interesting to think of these, the automation really starting at the transaction level and working mm -hmm. up as needed rather than this big AI, you know, monster is coming to get us and we're all gonna end up in the matrix. You know, that's just <laughs> like a futurism that I don't really buy into, but the futurism of, you know, we're gonna start with this really specific thing, a digital asset, and then we're gonna start having digital transactions. And from there, the digital transactions, like the, 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 the decision trees that go into the transactions get digitized and they get you know, distributed and that is, just seems more plausible and it also mm -hmm. i guess my inner optimist is like that's a little more livable i can do that <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite so scary i'm not going to see keanu reeves like have to learn how to be a jedi to get <laughs> <laughs> oh personally i would love to love to hang out with keanu reeves so i'm a little in favor of that but at the same time <laughs> i mean yeah don't don't want giant uh giant monsters coming after me yeah, I just, I kind of, I, I generally try to steer away from, you know, the, the hypothetical futurism of, of uh, the, the doomsday approach, or like we're all sitting in a, simu in a, simu a simulation, as um, uh, Elon Musk once punted <laughs> at that stage. Well, the likelihood that this is all just reality simula simulation is like really high, and I just think, what are you smoking? <laughs> Come on, man. And well, we, I don't, that? There's so I, many I, think it ha, I think it has a little bit of credence to it. Living living in a digital age, um, I'm not fully sold on it yet, but I, I think part of me kind of uh, uh, what are what are the words? Part part of me just kind of believes that it's a it's it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Just because it, it, if it is possible, we just wouldn't know about it at this point. That's true. That's true. I mean, I I'm hearing you. It sounds like you're a bit of like a a science fiction maybe a bit of a science kind of kid. Like, is that, does that like re resonate with, I don't know, how you grew up or like where you went to school? Were you always <laughs> like this imaginative, potentially science, fi science fiction, you know, innovator? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm big on just I'm dreaming and ideals, but in, in high school I was very much a math and science kid. Ca calculus and chemistry were always my favorite subjects, so uh, it kind of led naturally. I'm a big reader too, so I read a lot of uh, sci-fi and fantasy, so that kind of kind of bleeds I, I into never my... Guessed. Never would have expansive guessed. imagination. <laughs> uh, did you end up, you, you said you went and studied abroad at one point. Was it in college that you got to study abroad? I did. I studied abroad in Spain for, for a semester in uh, Granada, which was in, incredible. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. Top, oh, top I've never two. Been. That sounds amazing. I've been to Barcelona quite a few times, but not Granada. That sounds amazing. Uh, I love Barcelona as well. Gran Gran so Granada, if you've never been, you absolutely have to go. There's basically a giant castle that sits inside the city. Uh-huh. Oh wow! So and then it's it's semi mountainous, right? So like part of it, uh, part of the part of the town elevates and slopes up. So then you have this big, uh, big white like stucco quarter that overlooks the that overlooks the the castle. Then you have like a de more of a, a flatter downtown area. It's just it's really cool. And the the Sierra Nevada is in the background, like the mountains are in the background of the of the city. So it's it's just it's it's breathtakingly wow. beautiful. And I mean, it sounds like a great experience, but uh, how did, you know, math and calculus fit into that? Or were you there for, what were you studying over there? <laughs> so I, I, I kind of pivoted a bit when I went to college um, and I decided to double major in management and international business. And I had a minor in Spanish studies. Actually, originally I was, uh, I minored in Japanese for about a year and a half. Oh, wow. That would have been way too hard. <laughs> those two things are, yeah, those two languages are not so, even cultures are just not so similar. <laughs> no, no, very different. Um, I'm kind of happy I went back to Spanish though, because I took Spanish in high school. Uh, and that, that led me to, to studying abroad. I basically, as far as international business go, I wanted to, I wanted to travel the world a bit. I wanted to be able to work internationally. And my, my previous consulting gig really didn't allow me to do that. Um, but working with block apps enables me a lot more to travel. Like I'm, I'm going, I'm, I travel uh, within the country more so often than internationally. But this past uh, October, for example, I had flown to Australia for the for the Cybos Banking Conference, which was incredible. Sydney's also a oh, very, very, cool. very fun and beautiful city. Yeah, you were there for the the Cybo Conference. But what were some of the things that you felt like they touched on? Were they really discussing? Did you feel like there was a lot of conversation that had to do with blockchain when you were there, or did you feel like they were just starting to catch on and it hadn't, it didn't really have a big focus? 
Um, no, there were there was plenty of uh, blockchain uh, pre presenters there. I know that we had presented on one of the one of the side stages on the uh, so basically there were like four floors of the conference. And the fourth floor where our booth was was the innovation floor, the digital transformation floor. Mm -hmm. So you had some of the big names there, like Consensus was there. Um, we were we were chatting with Joe Joe Lubin a bit. He had a uh, he did his own. He did a couple presentations actually, I believe. Very cool. Um, yeah. So there was there was a lot of a lot of big names, a lot of good blockchain buzz uh, going around. Plenty of people from the, the the bottom first floors. A lot of the a lot of the bankers coming up just to see just what the hype's turn. about. Or I mean, yeah. a, a lot of people now though the, the education we're a lot further in the educational curve than we've ever. I mean, than we've been in like the past year or two, and it, it's yeah. exponentially rising. Most. Uh, business or front end people tend to know what blockchain is at least at a very high level and how it can help them better their operations and their business. Yeah. Um, maybe they don't fully understand technically or the technical limitations of it, but it's, uh, it's, it's really refreshing. Like when I first started my sale, uh, doing sales at block apps, I had one person call me saying, you know, I have, I have mines in Mexico. How do I, how do I mine the Bitcoin? And I That's so charming <laughs> was probably my favorite call I've ever had just because I, it took me totally off guard. That's fantastic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's probably my favorite story about a Bitcoin mining that I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to sell him on a, on a, on a distributed ledger though. We, we ended up not, uh, didn't not, quite work. It wasn't what he was no, looking for. No, so. no, it wasn't. <laughs> but you know, I received I significantly less of those calls, which is a great indication that uh, people are, people are better educating themselves in the technology. No, it's true. It's true. And that's, I mean, exactly why we started this podcast. It was just, it was obviously a need and people want to have an easy way to consume this and get more and more use cases, more of an idea of how this affects them as an end consumer, but also as an innovator, an entrepreneur. And there's so many, as you, as you know, I mean, people that are already in the business space are, are kind of adopting it faster and like getting up to speed and learning about it faster. But really the end user, it's, it, Blockchain's not going to be used to its fullest capacity until it's got crowd adoption. And just as the internet was not going to work until lots of people were using it. So um, I think it's just, we're all kind of fighting the good fight, trying to get information out there. Yeah, it's all about awareness at this point. And we're, I think we're still quite a ways off from full public adoption. Uh, we're going to see adoption much heavier within the enterprise space first. And I, I think that 2019 is going to be the year for enterprise block enterprise blockchain. Absolutely. People were saying it was 2018, but it, it really wasn't no. because no. 2018 was about initial education. People are starting POCs. 2019, you're going to see a lot of production applications going in yeah. um, from, from big Fortune 500 companies. I mean, I pretty much said I believe that every Fortune 500 company is either doing either has a production application ready for launch or launched already yep. they have built a poc or they're looking into build, building a poc and if yep. there's if any of the listeners are that working for a fortune 500 company right now and they're not looking into that then get on it because you're behind right exactly exactly that is actually the biggest takeaway of this is you know you've, you've heard it straight from the horse's mouth basically one of the biggest you know um dab producers in in the space is really mm -hmm. his block apps you guys are just are all over the place as, as of course your your partnerships with with united and, and Ticketmaster, you know clearly show so this is really incredible it's been really a pleasure to talk with you about this stuff is there anything else in terms of where we should go find you um and, and, you know, I've got all of your links for your LinkedIn. Do you have mm -hmm. any of your Medium? Oh, I see your Medium link here as well. I can make sure that that's up there. We've got a few of your articles. Maybe you'll get around to making some more content if you're not whining and dining your clients. <laughs> yeah, well, well, if I get around to it, uh, I have my, I guess my most public access, publicly accessible profiles are my LinkedIn, my, uh, my Twitter, and then my, my Medium page. That's fantastic. All right. Well, we'll be sure to include those links. And thank you so much, Brian Smokovich, for taking the time to talk with me here on the New Trust Economy. No, thank you so much for having me, Monica.